Last episode of this show, we talked about the idea of invisible lettering. And actually, that's pretty easy to attribute to any process, through colouring, writing, line work, whatever. In some regards, for certain stories, you'd want all those elements to be, in a way, invisible, in that they don't cause you to break the suspension of disbelief. But again, as discussed last time, that is also a way of limiting what you can do with the story, with your visuals. For certain cases, you might want to change your rendering style page by page, scene by scene, even panel by panel. J.H. Williams did an effect in Batman The Black Glove Story where he was pulling in characters from different backgrounds, and so he chooses to render them differently for the story, creating the idea that all of these are from different stories, mimicking other creators' styles. It's something he also did in Seven Soldiers and expanded upon in Sandman Overture, where Williams ended up rendering multiple versions of Sandman himself in multiple different types of media and laying them all on the same page. It's kind of like the idea of mixing live action and animation in Who Framed Roger Rabbit or Space Jam. There's an implication that these things exist on different planes. But it also serves as a way to say something about a character. These renderings of Sandman, they give a different impression of what kind of Sandman they are. When we see the boy in Goodbye Pun Pun rendered in a childlike manner here, it gives an impression of who he is even devoid of all context. As we talked about with lettering, it's a way of creating some additional character visually, without needing to get loads of exposition across. Calvin and Hobbes had a few strips that would be rendered in a serious, realistic way, and then switch out to the standard, more sort of stylized, cartoony look. And this works for a joke, true, but it's also a very clear way of showing that these are kids, drawn in an almost childlike, simplistic way in comparison to the rendering of the adults. You know, the way the stories are rendered themselves are actually telling us about the characters in the story, the way we should be taking those stories as readers. A serious polyp has a particular sequence that uses this idea and takes it in a very, very interesting direction and follows on quite directly from the previous episode in the way it deals with Asterius and Hannah. So last time I talked about the way Hannah's balloons were used to give her an almost childlike, innocent quality and there's a way that this translates to the art as well. Just for a bit more reference, there's a sequence in Batman, issue 15 by Tom King and Mitch Gerrards, and it uses three different art styles to show the changing relationship, and also match the art of the period the stories were originally told in. So it begins with a panel of Bruce Wayne and Selina Kyle, Batman and Catwoman, much, much earlier in time when their relationship was just hinted at and much more playful. But the style serves to show that visually as well. You're not just told this through their body language and what they're actually doing in the panel, but in the simplicity, in a sense, of the art style. As the art matures through the second and third panel, so does the actual content of the panel and so does their relationship. So we're seeing three panels that are doing three different things each time. They're placing us in a specific period of the character's history, they're showing us what stage their relationship was at, and visually they're also showing us how sophisticated their relationship was by the amount of detail used in the art style. The point I'm slowly but hopefully surely getting at is that it's not just the way you lead an eye through a page or the colour choices you make, but it's the actual style of art itself and that can be a major way of adding to the storytelling. And as a way of delving a little bit deeper, let's look at this sequence from Mysterious Polyp because I think it's a really great example. It works on the very building blocks of characters. Mazzuchelli is stripping back his art here to make a point. Here, Hannah is rendered in this ballpoint pen style, this soft pink colour, whereas below we can see Asterius is rendered in very specific 3D geometric shapes. Hannah is a sculptor, and what we can see from her specifically is form and light, two very key things for sculptors. For Asterius, as an architect, he's focused on shape and geometrics, how the shapes fit together to form something new. But it plays out through all the characters as well, the very fundamentals of who these characters are are built up through a specific art style. When we can look at these two images of these two people, of Hannah and Asterius, remove any word balloons, and understand how they are different. The very way they appear on the page isn't the same, and it alludes to some fundamental difference between them. Mazzuchelli then goes on to show that, in fact, everyone at the party is different. We're all made up of different foundations, and that's why every character has a different speech balloon. It's what makes us all human. He lays these out on the same page here together to teach us that, look, right, we're all unique. This is what Hannah is. This is what Asterius is. But there's emotion in this, and there's truth and there's beauty, and without exposition, Mazzuchelli creates one of the best sequences in comics on the next page. He spent that one page establishing the central concept. Hannah and Asterius' very basis of being is unique to themselves, diametrically opposed almost. And then he spends a page showing us how these two forces are able to combine. Now, before we talk specifically about that, what we need to mention is the mode in which this works, because Mazzuchelli is building us up to this moment and making sure we understand each part of this sequence entirely before moving on. And it's something he does a lot throughout the book. He actually teaches us how to understand this new visual language he's conveying. 
At the very start of the book, Mazzuchelli shows us how to read Asteria's polyp. He begins with a single image on the page. Next page, he splits that image into two panels, showing us that we read from top to bottom. Now he shows us the link between the panels. So if I show you a shot of a building and then inside of a location, now we can understand that we're inside that building I showed you in the first panel. A few pages later, he brings in panels that sit next to each other rather than stack vertically for the first time. And he uses the sound effect of the fire alarm to show us the sequence in which we're supposed to read these. So whenever Mazzuchelli brings something new to the table, he's very specifically taking a moment to show us how we're supposed to read that. So it never gets confusing and it really is incredibly well done and kind of genius. So he establishes how we're supposed to see all these people as individuals, and then he blends them together. And by this point, we fully understand what this sequence is meant to mean, what it's meant to emote. And it's a way of storytelling that is completely unique to comics. And it's why I wanted to really take some time to admire it and understand it. Because it takes what all those other examples do previously, the differing art styles, and it starts to combine them seamlessly to ask us more questions as a reader and tell us how love, attraction, affection can work, but entirely visually. Mazzuchelli takes those two rendering styles and he blends them into the same image. Initially, they rub up against each other in this panel and slowly they start to combine before fully engaging each other at the bottom of the page, like no one else in the room is. When you just read the book, it's completely and simply understandable. Two people are becoming attracted to each other and they're connecting. But Mazzuchelli asks you to think about it a little bit more too, to understand the true beauty of these two people's lives literally changing the fundamental way they exist because of the other person. He's telling us that this is what love is. The underlying building blocks are still there, we can still see Asterius's geometric shapes making up his form, but now he's being rendered fully. It's a combination of understanding how drawing works too, because often characters are initially made out of rough shapes, these geometric shapes that you can see Asterius made from, before then shaded and rendered. It's as though Mazzuchelli is saying Asterius has never been complete, but now here he is, fully understood. And with Hannah, it's like he's telling us she has this purer form. She's rendered, but there's something missing underneath. Like all the best characters in fiction, these are two people who are incomplete, and bringing them together allows them to be drawn as fully whole characters, at least for this moment. It's a rather stunning set of pages that alludes to some of the narrative brilliance throughout Asterius Polyp and David Mazzuchelli's work generally, but fundamentally it's showing a way of engaging a reader and allowing them to come to terms with a key storytelling point, but brave enough to do it almost entirely visually, to not have to hit the reader over the head with it, but to ask them to learn and accept and understand, and storytelling is always so much more powerful when you're able to lead the reader to their own understanding, rather than telling them. Thanks for watching. Strip Panel Naked exists on the back of the supporters at patreon.com slash stritpanelnaked. For their pledge, they get access to tons and tons of extra content updated every single week. So if you're a fan of the channel and you're interested, I'd love if you would take a look. For more comics talk and analysis, you can find me on Twitter at HassanOE. And finally, hit subscribe and that notification button to keep up to date with all the latest episodes. And we'll see you next time.